I'd like you to grab your Bibles tonight and just, just throw them open, see where they go. No, I'm kidding. I, I, I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'd like you to grab your Bibles. I, I think the first portion of Scripture I was going to grab was Second Chronicles chapter 20. So if you'd go there tonight. A couple weeks ago, I just returned from Dallas, Texas, and I was out there for the Rosh Hashanah conference. Um, for the Jewish New Year, we were at Glory of Zion, which is uh, Chuck Pierce's apostolic center and church there, and Dutch Sheets was there, and some others, and it was just phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. You know, it's not going to be that long from now that we're going to be entering a brand new year and a brand new decade. Think of that. Uh, not only a brand new year, but a brand new decade. We're about ready to enter the 20s. Think of that, the 20s, <laughs> the 20s, isn't that something, the 20s, I want to talk to you tonight about the roaring 20s, the roaring 20s, wow, hey, there's a few people in here ready tonight, you know, there's many voices that are prophesying and declaring a new era that the church right now is moving into a brand new era. And I, I personally, my wife and I, we believe this. We, tru we truly believe we are moving in to a brand new era in the church. And I believe it is, a, it is an era of revelation. Hear that tonight. It is an era of revelation that's going to unleash unprecedented victory in the earth and release the kingdom of heaven into the earth. Write this down tonight. Revelation establishes authority. Write it down tonight. If you're not taking notes, write it down. Revelation establishes authority. Okay? I believe it's going to be an era of revelation that's going to uncap such realms of authority, how is God going to do it? It's going to be through revelation. See, when you, when you know and understand what is yours, you will be able to wield the sword of the Spirit. The apot, thank you. Thanks. Come on, somebody. Come on. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17 says that the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. When you know what is yours, you will be able to wield the sword of the Lord with authority, having authorization and understanding what is yours. You will be able to take hold of the Word of the Lord and activate that Word and use that Word to move the enemy, that dragon, back Back to hell where he belongs. Are you hearing me tonight? I keep seeing there, there's, a, there's a magnificent story. It's found in 2 Samuel chapter 23, and it's about Eleazar. And it's a battle amongst the, the, the people of God and the Philistines. And it says that Eleazar, he fought so valiantly in this particular battle against the Philistines that it says Eleazar's hands, he was one of the mighty men, he, his hands clung to the sword. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you a prophetic picture tonight. His hand clung so hard. He fought so valiantly through this battle that when the battle was over, he could not release his sword, and they had to pry his fingers off of the sword to disengage from it. Are you getting it? So your sword, the sword of the Lord, the word of the Lord has to become literally like it is a part of you. That sword became like his, like a very part of his arm. Are you seeing that? Because the word always has to become flesh. John writes in John 1.14, he says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the only begotten of God, full of grace and truth. The word has to become reality, and it has to become flesh in us, where we take up the sword of the Spirit, and we become one with it. 
And we begin to use that word to conquer. We begin to use the word of the Lord to unleash and uncap the victory and the triumph of God over a city, over a region, over a nation, over the nations of the earth. Come on. Paul said, take up the word of God, for it is the sword of the Spirit. you got to take it up. On 2 Chronicles, well, I'm, I'm moving tonight. 2 Chronicles 20, 20, it says, believe the Lord your God and you shall be established. Believe his prophets and you shall prosper. I believe this is going to be a very key word, not, no pun intended. But I believe we're going to hear more and more 2 Chronicles 20, 20 moving into this new year. Moving into 2020, moving into this brand new decade, this new era of revelation that God's going to give to us. I believe we're going to see it again and again and again. Believe the word of the Lord. Believe the word of the Lord. Folks, if you're going to move in unbelief, you're going to be sunk every time. If you're going to move in doubt, if you're going to vacillate between doubt and unbelief all the time, you're going to be completely sunk. But if you can steady yourself to believe the word of the Lord, that you can stand at attention, that you can tremble at his voice, that you can stand in his word, believe his word in your heart, declare his word out of your mouth, you shall shall be established. And then he goes forward and he says, believe as prophets and you're going to prosper. And I'm going to tell you, there's a cry in every one of your souls to be established and to prosper in the thing that God has called you to in this hour. There is a burning in your heart. There is a burning in your soul to be established and prospering in this hour. I know there is. It's a new era, and I believe this word, that it's truly a new era, not just a new year, but it is an era of revelation. I've got to say it again. It's an era of revelation because revelation is what establishes authority, and the more revelation that begins to break in, to this habitation of what we call victory as a corporate body, the more revelation that begins to crash in into our spirit and take hold of us, the more power and territory we are going to be able to possess for the, for the kingdom of God. Era. I looked it up today. This is interesting. Era. And it means this. It means it's a fixed point in time. Listen to this. It's a fixed point point in time, which is a series of years that is reckoned. This is a powerful word. I just looked it up on the Google. You ever Googled? Yes, on the Google. It's a fixed point in time of a series of years that is reckoned. Now, where, where do we get that, that word reckon is also we know it to be reckoning. That's powerful. Don't miss that. Write that word down, reckoning. Reckoning. An era is one that begins a new period in history. Hear that again. An era is one that begins a new period in history for a person or a thing. Now, I like this word, reckoning, or to reckon. Reckoning, because it speaks of bringing judgment you got to hear this tonight. It speaks of loosing judgments. Well, we're going to go somewhere tonight in this, and I'm speaking to you again on the roaring 20s. Everybody say the roaring 20s. The roaring 20s. I'm in Daniel chapter 7, and I want you to go there tonight. Daniel chapter 7. We're going to move through some scriptures tonight because i got some stuff to impart. I feel you're ready. Come on, I feel you're ready. There's a reckoning that God wants to unleash through the earth. There is a reckoning. There are 
holy judgments that God is wanting to determine and release through the body of Christ, through his ecclesia, this church that Jesus is building, that he says the gates of hell will not prevail against him. And I'm telling you what, as for me and my house, that's the church that we're a part of. We are a part of the church that the gates of hell are not going to prevail against. You're not, we're not part of some weak, anemic, scared, broken down church. We are part of those that are bold as lions and righteous in this hour. Glory to God. Daniel, this is such a powerful, powerful chapter. I wish we could just open up. I don't have the time to do this tonight. We'll do this at another time. But Daniel chapter 7, and I'm going to begin to read in verse 21. He said, I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints. I was watching. He's in the spirit. Daniel's in the spirit. The prophet Daniel, he's in the spirit. He's watching. And this horn was making war against the saints. It was prevailing against them until the ancient of days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. And the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Wow. I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them until, until the Ancient of Days came and a judgment was rendered. A judgment, a reckoning was made in favor. Everybody say, in favor. Come on, shout it. In favor of the saints of the Most High. And the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Without a doubt, we are rolling to the greatest epic crescendo in human history. We are racing towards the end of an age to the dawning of the new age of Jesus Christ returning to planet earth to set up his throne in Jerusalem, on that temple mount, as King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, without going into every eschatological revelation at this point, what I want to say to you in this hour, there is a set time that Daniel was seeing concerning a shift and a change. But by faith, all the promises of God are yes and amen. Are you hearing me? All the promises of God are yes and amen. And when a people begin to believe the word of the Lord, they can tap into that promise and make it available at any moment. That's how Mary was able to go to her son and say, uh, it's time. Yeah, uh, no, uh, my, my time has not come. Mary said, oh, uh, yes, it has. Just do whatever he says to do. She looks at those boys and just says, ah, just do whatever he tells you to do. Are you seeing what I'm saying? Are you seeing it? There are those that put a demand upon the anointing like Mary did. Or I'm going to say it to you like this. They put a demand upon the word of the Lord. They look to a time that is herald, and they don't push it off into another millennium. They say, they grab a hold of it in faith, and they say, that promise is for us even now. Even now that God has rendered favor for us in this hour, and it is time for the saints to possess the kingdom of God. We're moving into a new era. It's a new decade, it's a new year, but it's a new era where the ecclesia, this church that Jesus is building, I believe that we will openly and aggressively lay siege to the dark kingdom where we will establish the rule and the authority of our king to the nations. I believe it. I believe this. I believe that the church is globally going to discover an authority that has been given to it by revelation. And we will uncover all that God has given us through the resurrection of Jesus. I believe this. I believe that the church globally 
is going to exercise an authority and power over all the works of the devil. We will operate and move in power over all the works of the devil. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8, it says, It was for this reason that Jesus was manifested in the earth that he might destroy the works of the devil. You got to hear this. See, Jesus knew his calling. He knew his destiny. He knew his purpose. His purpose was to come to destroy the works of that dragon, that old serpent, that old rebellious one that said, I will lift myself up. I will be worshipped like the Most High. Jesus said, oh, no, you won't. I'm going to come back and I'm going to remove all the authority that you took from my beloved creation. I'm going to take it back and they're going to whoop you. We are here. Thank you, Rick. <laughs> I receive it. We are here to manifest that kingdom realm, that power over darkness. That power over wickedness, that power of aggressive torment and depression and panic and anxiety and fear and sickness and disease and poverty. We are here to enforce the victory that Jesus came to give. Jesus said in Matthew 28, he said, all authority and power has now been given unto me in heaven and in earth. And he's given it to us. He's given it to you and I. Folks, this is not cheerleading and high kicking stuff. This is a revelation. And when the church taps into this revelation of our inheritance of what we have been given, we will be unstoppable. We'll be unstoppable. I believe that in this new era, we're going to discover the inheritance of our authority. And the inheritance of our authority comes from us being seated in the heavenly places. Ephesians, go there with, with me tonight. Ephesians 1. We're going to read a number of passages tonight. Ephesians 1. And I'm going to begin in verse 3. Let's pick up that first verse. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Now, you got to catch that. Because this is setting the place of revelation. Did you, did you catch that? It's setting the place of revelation. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And where at? In Christ. And Paul goes on and he wants us not to miss the place where Christ is. Christ is seated in glory, at the right hand of his Father, in full power and dominion and victory. That is where our spiritual blessings come from. They're in the heavenly places, but they are found only in one place, in Christ. And we are seated with him there. Verse 15. And therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love for the saints, I did not cease to give thanks for you, but making mention of you in my prayers. Here's the prayer. That God, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory. Call him Father of glory tonight. Say it. Father of glory. Come on, say it. Father of glory. That he may give to you the spirit 
of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Remember I said to you, revelation is what establishes authority. Revelation is what establishes authority. And Paul is telling us, this has been given to you. This spirit of wisdom and revelation is what I am praying over you all the time that you will receive, that your understanding will be enlightened, that you'll know what the hope of his calling is and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. What is his exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe? Don't miss that. The greatness of his power towards us who believe. It's not to those who are unbelief. It's not to those who are in doubt. The inheritance and the the riches come to them that believe. Are you catching that? You know, I've heard it said that just because you sit in a garage doesn't make you a car. Isn't that deep? You can sit in a garage all your life, but it's not going to turn you into a Porsche. And you can sit in church all of your life. And not have the lights go on. It takes revelation, illumination of the Holy Ghost to enlighten your spirit what belongs to you. It is yours. It is yours. It belongs to you. Christ has done it all to give it to us. This exceeding great power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Now, what is that mighty power? It's which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and he seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. So the power of God was made manifest when God lifted his son out of that borrowed tomb in the city of Jerusalem, God manifested his mighty power when he, as a father, lifted his son up out of the grave. And because of that action of power being demonstrated, it released this inheritance to us. Now watch this. He seated them at the right hand in the heavenly places. Where? Far above all principality and power, might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in the age, this age, but also in the age to come. And he put all things under Jesus' feet, and he made him to be the head of all things to the church, which is his body. That's you and I. The fullness of him who fills all in all. He raised his son up. He sat him at the right hand of the throne. And I want you to see where he's at. Because, see, again, revelation will establish your authority. Revelation will establish your authority. Jesus was seated above all principalities, thrones, powers, might, and dominion. Everything was put under his feet. Now, Paul writes on in Ephesians 2. And now he starts talking about you and I. He said, and you, he made alive. And you, Brian, Mike, Mark, Bren, Aaron, he made you alive. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, weren't we? Somebody shout, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, which we all once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince and power of the air. The spirit who is now at work and the sons of disobedience among whom we were all once conducting ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we were by nature children of wrath just like the others. Hello? But God, but God who is rich in mercy... 
Because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead and trespasses, watch, he made us alive together with Christ, for by grace you've been saved. And he raised us up together. He made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. God has raised his sons and daughters above all principalities, powers, wickedness, thrones. I want you to see your level and your position of authority that Christ has given you. I want you to think about the vantage point now that you are viewing what is happening in the earth realm now because you are far above it. You may be seated right now in this room at 5614 Richardson Road, but that's only what's happened in virtual reality. In the superior unseen realm, the principalities and powers and thrones, they know that you and I right now, we are seated in heavenly places far above them, and we have been given power and authority over that wickedness. Yeah. Hallelujah. It's where you are. He has raised you. And he placed you in Christ, and you were seated. See, this is not something that's going to happen off in the future. It happened when God raised his son from the grave. Because when he was raised, you and I were raised with him and seated at the right hand of God. <laughs> Folks, this is the glorious gospel. This is the gospel of glory. That's why he's called the father of glory. This is the gospel of glory. This is not just us tripping our way through life, fumbling our way through, hoping that we make it to heaven by the skin of our teeth. No, this is a gospel of power, a gospel of victory, a gospel of triumph, a gospel of overcoming. Hallelujah. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Those are powerful words, grace and kindness. See, isn't that amazing that God unleashes power through grace? He unleashes power through kindness. It was his dream all along. I'm not going to let your enemy seduce you, trap you, manipulate you, torment you, cause you to walk in shame all of your life and give you another identity outside of being my cherished, beloved son and daughter. God would have none, no part of that. And that's why he sent Jesus, so that in his kindness and grace we could walk upright we could walk as beloved children of God in the kindness and the grace of God, but yet wielding our power over all the works of the devil. Yes. It's by grace that you've been saved through faith. It's not of ourselves. Thank God. It's not of Brian Gibbs. Thank God. It's of him. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, these words that you let your eyes roll across in your scriptures, on your smart pad, and your phone, and, and in your pages tonight, we have read over and over and over and over and over. And I'm going to tell you something. We need to be deep sea diving these scriptures for profound revelation to come forth to us in this hour. Paul was praying, you've got to have the spirit of revelation. 
You've got to have the spirit of revelation. You've got, that's what Paul was praying over and over and over and over to the church and letting it wash over them again, wash over them again, wash over them again, so that your mind that is and at enmity against God or at war with God will start getting renewed that says God has given this power and authority to me. And it's time I start yielding and wielding it. Are you with me? Where are we? Where is my position? We are, we are at the throne. Write it down. I am at the throne. I am at the throne. See, don't be discouraged, Cody. Sometimes the church comes in ready to worship. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes we forget where we're at. Sometimes we just think we're in a church building and we're having coffee and stuff. But sometimes, sometimes we come and we've come out of a place of revelation and we're ready to get and stand before our position among the multitude that is innumerable before the throne. And we start recognizing actually where we're at. We start becoming aware of where we're at. I'm not just heard in this room because there's amplification and I have a microphone. What I'm being declared, what I'm declaring tonight is going through the heavenly places. It's going through the heavenly places. And it's declaring the authority that Jesus Christ has given to his ecclesia, to his bride, to his cherished ones. You have authority. You have, a, you have power. You have authority. From the time that my, I, I, our children could talk, we were talking to them about their authority over the devil. You never need to be afraid of your enemy. Glory to God. Where am I? You're at the throne. And if you're at the throne, then this is what it means. You're at the place of all authority. At the throne is the place of all authority. You know what that means, folks? Write it down. It means we're on the offensive. We are not on the defense. We're on the offensive. That means... How many of you ladies, you, you know out there that the team that has the ball is on the offense and the team that doesn't have the ball is on the defense? Good job, Mary Kay. That's right. So the team that has the ball is maneuvering their control and their plans to make the touchdown, and they're gaining ground, and they're, gra- they're gaining territory, and they're gaining ground, and they're gaining territory. We're on the offense. We're not on the defense. You know why? Because Jesus gave us the ball. Are you hearing what I'm saying? We're not on the defensive. We are to be laying siege to the dark realm. We are to be laying siege to the dark realm. We are to be uncovering them. We are to be bringing them out into the open as a mockery that they are. Now, how do I know this? Because Colossians 2 says that when Jesus was raised from the dead... It says that he rendered all of these principalities, powers, and thrones. He rendered them powerless. He made an open spectacle of them through his cross. And this is exactly what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be showing that the enemy's power has been defeated has been defeated. The glory is at the throne. 
Say it. The glory is at the throne. The glory is at the throne. And the glory is in the countenance and in the face of God. And if the glory is at the throne and it's at the face of God, then that means you and I are covered in the glory. That's what it means. If we are seated in heavenly places, if we are at the throne, that is where the glory is. And that means you are covered and bathed in glory. You're smothered in glory. It also means that you're looking down. You're looking down to principalities, powers, mights, and dominions. I want you to listen to Philippians chapter 2 tonight. This is out of the Passion Translation. Philippians 2, and I'm going to begin to read in verse 10. Are you there? You're moving there. I can hear you moving. It's good. Turn those pages. Is it behind me? Let's do it. You ready? Let's do it. The authority, the authority, aha, the authority of the name of Jesus causes every knee to bow in reverence. Everything and everyone will one day submit to this name. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? Everything and everyone will one day submit to this name in the heavenly realm, in the earthly realm, and in the demonic realm. Every tongue will proclaim in every language, Jesus Christ is Lord Yahweh, bringing glory and honor to God his Father. You see that? It's going to happen right there at the throne. Every foul demon spirit that has mocked God, mocked his church, mocked his bride, fought against his bride, they're going to bow their knee and proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord Yahweh. And it's going to bring glory to God as the Father watches them bow their knee to his Son. <laughs> Woo! That fires me up. Oh, that fires me up. The throne. In Psalm 89, verse 14, it says that righteousness and justice are the very foundation of God's throne. Righteousness and justice are the very foundation of God's throne, and mercy and truth go before his face. Wow. Wow, that's powerful. I'd like you to grab one, uh, Psalm 149, and I'm going to try you on for size tonight. Psalm 149, and I'm reading out of the New King James. A couple more minutes, because I'm going to go. Psalm 149. Sing to the Lord a new song. Come on, lift your hands. Sing to the Lord a new song. And his praise in the assembly of the saints. Let Israel rejoice in her maker. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name with the dance. Let them sing praises to him with the timbrel and the harp. Whoa. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. Don't you love that? The Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the humble with salvation. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud on their beds. Watch this. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth. Whoa. And a two-edged sword in their hand. To execute vengeance to the nations and punishments on the people to bind their kings with chains 
and their nobles with fetters of iron to execute on them the written judgment. This honor have all the saints. Oh, praise the Lord. Uh, whoa, go ahead and shout hallelujah. Come on. I don't know if you're seeing it. Are you catching it? Are you catching what you and I have been given authorization to do? Are you catching the whiff tonight that God wants you to start using the power of activating his word? He said, let the praise of God, let it be in your mouth. You got, come on, folks. We're not just reading scripture tonight. We're talking about what we're called to do. Let the praises of God be in your mouth. When we come in this room, you let the praises of God be in your mouth. When you come in this room, don't you go on mute. Don't you stand there and go on vacation. When you get in this room, you let the praises of God explode out of you. you got to find your roar. You better find your roar in this house. And don't you let anything take it. He said, then you let the two-edged sword be in your hand. There it is again. Take up the sword of the Spirit. And execute vengeance on the nations. Punishments on the people to bind their kings with chains. And their nobles with fetters of iron to execute on them the written judgment. This honor has all the saints. Praise the Lord. What I'm trying to give to you tonight is God has given us authority through the proclamation of our words, through our prayers, through our intercession, that what we say matters. What we say matters. What we pray here matters. What we sing here matters. What we declare and prophesy matters. We are the ones to start shifting this city, this region, this state into divine order. It has to become a revelation. It has to become a revelation. It, we have to have the Holy Spirit breathe on us so that we get a spirit of understanding. So that when we stand before God, we're standing under the truth of understanding. Are you seeing it? We stand under that truth of revelation. And revelation establishes your authority to start moving in the power of God. To recognize the power of God coming out of your mouth is just as powerful as God's word coming out of his mouth. It's part of our intercession. It's part of our prayer. You cannot be silent. Take a breath. Talk amongst yourself. Commercial break. I need some water. Thank you, Lord. I want to ask you a question tonight, and I want you to wrestle with it. I want it to wrestle with you. I want you to wrestle with it. I want this question to wrestle with you. Do you believe God's going to deal with his enemies? Do you believe God's going to deal with his enemies? You believe God's going to take vengeance? I'll tell you, it's a terrifying truth. The answer is, oh, yes, he, he will. He's promised it, and he's the God of promise. He doesn't break his promise. I want to give you a few more scriptures tonight, and I want to get very focused, okay? I want, I want right now, I want you to dial down your scope, okay? Lock in on that big buck right now. Dial in your scope. Here we go. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 10. I'm going to ask you again, will God deal with his enemies? Will God repay? Will God avenge? Oh, he's going to roar from heaven. He's going to roar from heaven. Will God avenge? Will God repay? You better believe he will. 
Isaiah chapter 40, verse 10. Listen to these words. It says, Behold, the Lord shall come with a strong hand, and his arms shall rule for him. Behold, his reward or his recompense is with him and his work before him. The Lord will come with a strong hand, and his arms shall rule for him. Behold, his reward and that word there is recompense, is with him, and his work will be before him. Now, I want to tie this word. I want you to go a couple more pages. You're in 40. Now go over to 59. Go to 59. And I'm going to be reading out of the Amplified on this scripture. So if it gets a little louder, it's because I'm reading out of the Amplified. <laughs> ba ba ba. Isaiah 59, I'm reading out of the Amplified. Are we there? Here we go. And he, the Lord, he will put on righteousness like a coat of armor. You seeing that behind me? He will put on righteousness like a coat of armor. The Lord will put on salvation like a helmet on his head. Are you seeing this? He will put on garments of vengeance for clothing and cover himself with zeal and great love for his people as a cloak. As their deeds deserve, so he will repay wrath to his adversaries, retribution to his enemies, to the islands and the coastlands, he will repay. I want you to see that. That is some powerful imagery about God saying, I'm coming, I'm going to bring recompense, I'm going to set things in order, I'm going to deal in vengeance. One more time. The Lord is the one who puts on righteousness like a coat of armor. You seen those words behind me? Okay. Now we're moving in tandem. We're, we're together. He's putting on salvation like a helmet upon his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal and furious divine jealousy as a cloak. My God. Verse 18, it goes on. It says, as their deeds deserve, so he will repay. Wrath to his adversaries retribution to his enemies, to the islands and coastlands, he will repay. We don't often talk about this, do we? But God is an avenging God. God is a God that will bring retribution. God is a God who will bring recompense. He will bring his reward, but he will also judge the nations. And he is coming as the righteous judge. And the very foundation of his throne is righteousness and justice. And he will dress himself in righteousness. He will dress himself in salvation. He will put it on in his zeal. And he will bring recompense. Now one more good shot of good news. Go a couple more pages to Isaiah 67. This gives us a beautiful picture. Isaiah 61, I'm sorry. Isaiah 61. You recognize this. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he's anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. You there? Isaiah 61. Remember, Jesus took this scroll. Remember that? He took Isaiah. He looked for it. It was in the city of Nazareth. You'll remember those of you that went to Israel with us. He stood up in the synagogue in the city of Nazareth, and he was handed the role of Isaiah, and he looked for this very segment of what we know to be called chapter 61, and he declared, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. He's anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He sent me to heal the, the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of prisons to those that are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. I want your eyes to dance over now to verse 7. Because when God comes, this is what he does. He says, instead of your shame, you're going to have double honor. Instead of your shame, go ahead, you will have double honor. Instead of confusion, 
They shall rejoice in your portion, and therefore in the land they shall possess double. Wow. And everlasting joy shall be theirs. Don't you jump over that too fast. You see in that? He says, when I come, he said, you're going to possess double honor. Instead of you having shame and confusion, I'm going to give you double honor. Are you receiving this tonight? Are you receiving this? He said, you're going to possess double and everlasting joy is going to be yours. Verse 8, for I, the Lord, I love justice. I hate robbery for burnt offering. I will direct their work in truth. I love those words. For I, the Lord, I love justice. I love justice. You know, it's, it's hard to believe right now what is going on the, in the United States of America. Isn't it? It's hard to believe what has been allowed, the corruption that's been allowed to prevail in our nation. I want to go back to the front of this train. We're moving into a new era where the church is going to start moving in greater power and authority and dominion to release his kingdom. How's this stuff going to be dealt with? You know, God knows how to deal with the corruption and the lunacy of Washington, D.C. And you know you're anointed to do it. You're anointed to do it. Last scriptures, Deuteronomy chapter 32. God says, vengeance is mine. Deuteronomy 32, verse 35, he says, Vengeance is mine and recompense. Their foot shall slip in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things to come are hastening upon them. Oh, God, that's a scary verse. Vengeance is mine and recompense. Their foot shall slip in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand. And the things to come hasten upon them. I want to tell you what, folks. The righteousness and justice of God is hastening to this planet. But this is also an hour where God wants to use his ecclesia, his church, to command the nations at attention to bring honor to the king of glory. The Apostle Paul wrote these words in the book of Galatians, chapter 6. You know these words. It says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that also will he reap. One more time. Do not be deceived. Are you watching all of this going on in our nation? People, people just arrogantly mocking God and all that is godly, strutting around in their pride, giving the finger to the heavens to God. I'm going to tell you, folks, we got to be reminded, God's not mocked. I read to you, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There is a day of reckoning coming. That's a scary time. God's not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that also should he reap. I'm telling you what, that should bring you great joy in your personal life. You have an eternal reward and an inheritance that cannot be stolen. Glory to God. I want to read something to you in closing tonight. Can I do this? You can put your Bibles aside. As some of you know that Dutch Sheets is a very close friend to me and Bran. He's more than a friend. He's really a spiritual father in our life, amongst others, that is very dear to us. But his brother wrote a book. Tim Sheets wrote a book. It's called A New Era. It's a powerful book. In this small segment here, I want to read to you. It's called No More Delay. No More Delay. Delay. 
hear that tonight. No more delay. He said, in this new era, promises are being fulfilled. You are entering a season when promises will fully be fulfilled by the weight of God's presence that is coming upon you. The fullness anointing that is on Jesus will be revealed at greater levels. John 1 and 16, it says, And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace, grace that increases and multiplies to fully fill all things. It's a grace that doesn't decrease. It never has. Grace only multiplies. Oh, I love that. Grace never decreases. Grace only multiplies. When the Holy Spirit emphasized this to me, I spent hours walking and decreeing no more delays. Listen to these words. He said, I bind delay in Jesus' name. I hate delay. How many of you hate delay? Yeah, me too. Me and Bren. He said, I resist you in the name of Jesus. No more delays to the promises of God. No more delays by the kingdom of darkness. No more delays from hindering spirits. No more delays. I'm stepping into a new time. I'm stepping into a new season of greater glory, and I refuse to allow any delay to hold on to me. Listen to these words. You can miss a move of God and a greater glory through unbelief. And the truth is, many probably will. The generation in the wilderness was the first generation that missed it. Think of that. The generation in the wilderness were the first to miss it. They did not enter the promised land because of their unbelief. Unbelief will keep you hindered by delayed tactics from the enemy. Listen, when God comes with greater presence and glory, it is a game changer. Not only are we changed, but everything changes. He knows how to change things. He knows how to change America. He knows how to change the lunacy going on in Washington, D.C. He knows how to change the nations of the world. God is not stumped. He knows how to shift us into a fuller measure of his promises and his glory. A fuller measure of his power and miracles experienced in the earth. God is saying, this is Tim Sheets, God is saying, there are certain plans that I have in mind that I'm not going to wait on anymore. I'm done waiting. Certain delays against my church no longer. I'm going to increase my weight in my presence. Delays of my promises made to individual believers are being dealt with. You better receive that for yourself. Delays of my promises made to individual believers are being dealt with. Agree with my word. Step in to the greater glory. Don't miss. Don't miss this through unbelief. Don't miss the greatest days in church history. The ecclesia rules against delays. Now loose the angels that have been assigned to assist you and release this decree by faith. I want you to lift your hands tonight. I want you to stand and I want you to lift your hands. And I want to pray this prayer over us tonight that Tim wrote.